start. It's a pleasure to welcome our last speaker of the academic year, Jimmy Tan, who is now at the uh, University of Bristol, and he's going to tell us something about simultaneous dance and non-dance sports. Right? Okay, well, uh, I want to thank Ilya and Florin and for inviting me to speak. Um, okay, so I want to talk to you about simultaneous dance and non-dance orbits. And so this is going to be based on uh, some of my joint work with uh, Bergelson and Einzieler, and then some other joint work with uh, Rong Gong Shi and, and some solo work. So I'll make that clear when we get to each of the theorems. But okay, so I, I want to study something very um, natural and basic. So I just want to start in the most basic way. So I have a dynamical system. And for now, I just want to think of it as a self-map between um, a s the phase space x to a self. Okay? And since I want to study dense orbits and non-dense orbits, I, I need a notion of density, or, or uh, so I need to put on a topology. Okay? So this phase space has a topology, and I want to study these sets. So I'm going to denote d of t to be the set of points with dense orbit under this dynamical system, and n d of t to be the set of points with non-dense orbits. Okay, so these are complementary sets. And as I said, once you have a topology, whether a point visits every neighborhood of the space or not is a, f a fundamental way of characterizing a point. And so therefore, these sets, the sets where uh, every point visits uh, all points visit every neighborhood, and where all points don't visit every neighborhood are fundamental um, sets to study for any dynamical system in this very broad framework. All right. So right away, this is a little too broad for, for me or to, to say anything too interesting about. So I will um, restrict the domain, but, also, but still to very interesting and a large class of dynamical systems. And I want to then tell you about dense sets or dense orbits. Okay? And so the, the, what I want to restrict to is I want T to preserve a, um, an ergodic probability measure mu. Okay? And since I want to study um, dense orbits with my probability measure, I want to be able to see everywhere in space. So in particular, I want the support of mu to be, uh, to be x. Okay. So all right, but this is still quite broad. And right away, dense orbits are very easy. Is x compact or not? No. Right away, this is uh, very easy because by the bergdorf ergodic theorem, I know that I have this, that the measure of the set of points with dense orbits, it's full. Okay, so it's a probability measure, so it's a full measure. This is um, just follows from the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and since this set is the complement, that tells me that uh, that set has measure zeros and null set. Just one more thing I want you to to note. By the way, stop me and ask questions if something's not clear. Okay, so. Um, there's one more thing to note. If I have a, f a countable family of maps T on the same phase space, preserving the same measure, uh, ergodic measure, then I also know that I can take an intersection over all of them. Uh, sorry, I need the. Okay, and this is still full measure. So in other words, if I have this family that, that has the same property, it's stable under countable intersections. And this is a nice property that I want to, to have. All right, so dense orbits, pretty clear. What's, what's TN? TN is uh, going to be a, f a countable family of maps T. With the same probability measure. Same probability measure, same phase space. OK. And that's because, of course, full measure sets, I can just intersect them. Yeah, right? OK, so non-dense orbits. So th this is a very um, a lot of information for dense orbits. For non-dense orbits, I will give you some examples. There are many examples. I'll, I'll mention two that are very relevant for this talk. Okay. So 
the motivations are going to be uh, from number theory and from dynamics, but in, in fact, they're, they're actually related. So but I, I want to just um, tell you this. I want to just, um, what do you call it, label it like this. Okay. So I want to think of a, a real number. And this can be generalized to any dimension and um, actually higher rank. Take a real number, and I want to just form the lattice given by this real number. There's a ZD here, which I'm going to uh, suppress writing. This is going to be an element of SL2Z mod SL2R. Okay? This, is, this forms a lattice. This fundamental domain has area 1. Okay? So it's a unimodular lattice sitting in the plane, and I have this set by ejection. Now, there's a well-known uh, correspondence called Donnie correspondence that tells me, and I'll define this set in a little bit, uh, in like about 10 minutes, but there's a, some subset of real numbers that we call badly approximable real numbers. And the set has some very interesting properties. One thing, it's a null set, okay? But um, it has full Hausdorff dimension and a few other properties, which I'll mention in a moment. But alpha is badly approximable if and only if, I'm gonna call this thing, this lattice lambda sub alpha, okay? Um, it's badly approximable if this lattice in the space of unimodular lattices has bounded uh, forward GT orbit. So forward orbit under the geodesic flow. Which is just this. Okay. So this is known as Donnie's correspondence. And this was discovered in 85 by S.G. Donnie. So in particular, what else did he show? He showed, well, we, I just said this is a null set of full Hausdorff mention. In fact, it's something called winning, which is a strengthening of the full Hausdorff mention. And this also is winning. And this is what S.G. Donnie showed. Now, winning was shown by Wolfgang Schmidt, the number theorist, uh, in 66. Okay. I don't want to tell you precisely what winning is. Winning is a, um, a tool that one can use to describe subsets of manifolds to have nice properties. But I will tell you the properties. So, okay. So, if I have a countable family of um, subsets, these are going to be winning. Uh, subsets of some manifold of X. This is a manifold. Okay. What do, what do I have? Well, I have two properties. Well, there's, there's a number of properties, but the, there are two important properties for this talk. The first one is that the, the Hausdorff dimension, which I'll always denote by this, of each element is equal to the Hausdorff dimension of the manifold. Okay. In particular, it has full Hausdorff mention because Hausdorff mention cannot, of a subset cannot be bigger than the, the Hausdorff mention of the ambient space. Okay, that's one thing. So this is why I said this is a, general, uh, a generalization of being full Hausdorff mention. And the other thing is this property here, the stability under countable intersections. Okay, so, all right. Okay, in particular, since it's winning, it's Hausdorff mentioned is full. Okay? Now, Donnie's correspondence says what? Well, it says that the set of uh, lattices which have bound to forward orbit under the geodesic flow, well, this is a, a hard measure null set, but it's winning, so it has full Hausdorff mention. Okay. Any questions so far? It's not a single set, it's a family. Yeah, but uh, so you 
you have this line which is the intersection of A and is union. What does that mean? Uh, each of the ANs is a winning, set, a winning set, and the, in, in the intersection is winning. Oh, right. that, that's why I call it stability under okay. intersection. So yes. Okay. okay. Um, right. So I've told you about dense orbits and non-dense orbits, and so the, the 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 talk is about simultaneous dense and non-dense orbits. So just let me um, tell you about that. And so the first question is. Um, if I, oh, no, actually, there's one more example I, I need to tell you about because that's, that's the, the primary example of the talk. So there's another example of, of non-dense orbits. So if I take a map T from the d-dimensional torus to itself, okay, and I let T be a linear um, endomorphism of the torus, or in particular, uh, what I want is for it to be in uh, GL and, sorry, D, um, that's in this, nope. GL, where is that? GLDR intersect uh, all matrices with integer lattice, uh, integer entries, okay? So if, in the, in this, um, if it's this type of transformation, then there's a theorem of Broderick, Fishman, and Kleinbach that says that the non-dense orbits are winning. Okay, so, um, so we know that um, nd of t is winning. And this is a, a theorem of Broderick, Fishman, and Kleinbach. There are some pre-results before this one. So um, Donnie had some uh, result related to this. I had a, a, a result. Uh, Abercrombie and Nair have a result. And then more recently, there's a, a res later result by, um, by Wu, and, and I have some other new things. Here, but but the, the theorem that I want you to, to know that we need to know for this talk is that this set is a, a winning set, the non dense orbits. Mm -hmm. Yes, you define winning on this set? it's not. Um, I didn't define winning, and the reason I didn't define it is because it's technical and it's not really important for the talk. What I really want to know is these properties. Okay, it's, a, it's an infinite two player game that's um, played on the manifold and it, it, it specifies properties of, of sub subsets. All right, so back to the question of non-dense orbits and dense orbits simultaneously. Okay, so, uh, okay. so the question is, okay, so this, nd of t intersect, uh, so I'm gonna just, now take, um, okay, D of S for something reasonable, okay? So how big? So two transformations? Yeah. Two transformations, S and T, okay? On the same phase space. All right, um, well, there's clearly times where this can be empty, right? So, uh, example, yeah, <laughs> t equals s, empty. Are you assuming empty. the same measure? Huh? Are you assuming the same measure? Yes, okay. yeah, same phase space, same very measure. This is, <laughs> so this is empty. Um, actually, if, if, they're, if they're related by powers, it's gonna be empty, because the, the orbits are the same. But that's essentially the only obstruction. Okay, so that's our theorem. So theorem, one, and this is by myself, Einzeler, uh, Bergelson, uh, Einzeler, myself. And this is gonna appear in Israel at some point. Is right now. All right, uh, it says this. So I have T, S on my torus. 
These are going to be commuting, so I need them to commute for the proof, and you'll see why. Hyperbolic twirl automorphisms um, of the torus, okay? Such that, well, T and S generate a algebraic Z2 action without rank one factor. So I'll write that down. I'll tell you what that means. Generate an algebraic, oh, maybe I'll move over here, um, algebraic Z2 action without rank one factors. Okay. Uh, then the conclusion is it's quite large. So then uh, the Hausdorff mention of uh, of uh, sets dense under which well, I guess it doesn't matter that one t and non dense under s uh, this is full this is equal to d or this is the d torus okay so except for um, for when they generate this this rank one factor uh, then we get full Hausdorff mention. Now, a priori starting out, it's not clear whether this should be full or not. All right. Uh, there's one more thing I want to note, uh, I want to mention. So if I set t equal to s, here's an example of, of sets that are winning. has full Hausdorff mention. And full measure has full Hausdorff mention. I intersect two full Hausdorff mention uh, sets, and I can get it to be empty. OK, so the winning. Um, thing does not necessarily play well with full house or, or full measure or, or positive measure. Okay, so just want to point that out. All right, um, these factors. Well, an algebraic Z two action is just uh, an abelian group uh, automorphism of Z two into the automorphisms of the torus. Okay, algebraic automorphisms. And a factor, now let me write some of it down. A factor is just going to be a surjective homomorphism. So, all right. So then some surjective homomorphism. So I have my pi d, I have my algebraic action. Here's my h, it's surjective. I have some other torus and some other algebraic action. This is going to be the factor if, if this thing commutes. Okay, the factor of that for every m. All right, and then it's rank one if uh, if I look at the factor, it reduces the powers of one map. This is just so. What does the factoring do? It it, it looks at induced tori, and it's just saying that. When I look at induced tori, my action better not devolve to powers of one map. Because I know what happens when I get powers of one map, right? It's going to give me uh, the empty set. OK. So, um, so if you want, that condition right here is just a generalization of being multiplically dependent. So as long as it's not multiplically dependent, on induced tori, then I get my result. But we still want them to commute, right? And, and, and uh, we need to commute. That's right. You'll see why in a moment. OK. Um, now, in this paper, there is another uh, theorem. Uh, I will write down some of the other theorems, sort of. So as I mentioned in my um, abstract, there's some, something for a co-compact co Lie group. This is also in the same paper. Um, I don't really want to write I want to give you a, a proof of theorem one. And the proof here is similar. OK? Um, theorem three, which I don't want to tell you about because the proof is different, is here without commuting. So for, um, uh, no, for, um, for toral. Uh, diffeomorphisms for C2 
vectorial diffeomorphisms. Okay, on the two torus. Using some other technique, you can also show um, something weaker. Uh, you can show show that this n d intersect d s is I don't know um, uncountable. Some other some conditions have to be satisfied here. So there's another result. This is just me. There's a result by uh, Lytle and Meyer for um, toral automorphisms on, uh, on D tori using yet another technique. And then finally, there's the result with myself and Rongo Shi where we look at non-compact phase spaces. So, so far, everything I've told you about related to dense and non-dense orbits has been about compact phase spaces, torus, co-compact Lie group. Okay, so the fundamental domain here has finite, uh, it, no, it's compact, not just finite hard measure, torus. Uh, but if we look at this case, we get some interesting um, number of theoretical results. So let me write it down. Here D is gonna be two. In our paper with Xi, D can be two or three, but not more. And I'll explain why. So um, XD will just be SL. Um, yeah, I don't know why I've changed uh, which direction I mod out by, but it doesn't really matter since we're not going to mod out on the other side by anything. OK? So space of unimodular lattices, the same thing, I'm just modding out by the other side. Uh, the expanding horospherical subgroup. Remember, d is equal to 2 here. So uh, this is going to be r d minus 1 into xd. And what I'm going to do is going to take the Hoare cycle. Oh, sorry. I take my uh, real number s and map it into the Hoare cycle. OK. So this is the setup. And so here's our theorem. By the way, this is the unstable horror cycle for the uh, GT action I wrote down a little while ago. I'll rewrite it in a moment. So here's theorem four. Again, this is she and myself. Okay, and this is going to come out in IMRN at some point. Okay, so um, I have n being a uh, integer bigger than or equal to 2. Okay, so I'm going to have a, a, a circle map. That would be this map. So my t is just going to be a map from the circle to itself. OK, so uh, it's d equals 1. Um, it's going to map, sorry, uh, by, by this, I just mean uh, the real number mod 1, OK? 2. Um, it's just multiplication by n, OK? And I allow my, yes? Is this a real number? S is a real number. This? Yeah. I'll just call it one. Um, OK. Uh, this is confusing, so I'll just write it here. Two, one, two, uh, two, yeah. The, re the reason is that in our paper, we can also do d equals three. But, but no more, so two. OK. So this is just a standard uh, multiplication map on the, the, the circle. I need to write it like this because I'm, I'm mixing different uh, actions a little bit. OK, so that's one map. I'm going to pick out a number of points in some set. So S1. Uh, SM. These are going to be in R. Okay. And my, my geodesic flow, well, I want to sample it at some time, T naught. It doesn't really matter. This could just be, um, this could just be a flow. It's going to be this. All right. Okay, so this is the, the setup. 
And then, so what is the conclusion? Then the set of real numbers such that, uh, well, if I look at the, I can only do four orbits here. The four orbit, well, OK, the reason is, of course, this map is not invertible. So um, of, multi of the multiplication map, OK, if I look at its orbit, and I take its closure, and I want it to miss all these mark points, S1 up to Sn, this is going to be empty. Okay, and um, what else? And if I look at the induced action of the geodesic uh, flow, let's call this map G. So I'll write GT so many times. Forward orbit, okay. Of, well, if I take my S, put it into my horror cycle, spanning horror cycle, and push it into the space of even modular lattices. I'm going to be pushing it by this, this, the geodesic flow. Okay. This is supposed to be dense. Then this set has full Hausdorff dimension. Okay. So this is a non-compact uh, non space. And the reason I mentioned this result, why it's interesting, is because there's a, a nice interpretation as in Diophantine approximation or number theory. And it's as follows. But are there any questions on the statement here? So we're saying non-dense under multiplication map, dense under uh, the geodesic flow. So we show that this is winning or only that No, no. You, um, no uh, so for all of these uh, mixed cases, you can't use winning okay. because um, because uh, the dense set is, in general, not winning. For the Taurus case, remember, I showed that uh, uh, Broderick, uh, Fishman, and Klumbach showed this is winning. Yeah, yeah. So its complement can't be winning. Because if it were, you could intersect it, and you get a winning set, which is full Hausdorff dimension. All right, so uh, nothing is shown to be winning. Okay. Here's a corollary that is related to um, something that Bob Kaufman did in the 80s. And and so Kaufman's technique is different. He uses um, Fourier analysis on measures living inside a set of badly proximal numbers, but we're going to uh, derive, derive something related using our technique. But, but let me now define for you what I did not define a little while ago. So a set of badly proximal numbers, this is just some uh, subset inside the real numbers. Okay. And you can generalize this to vectors, matrices, et cetera. So this is the real number for which there exists some positive constant depending on x, such that um, if I look at the infimum over all integers p, then qp, uh, qx minus p, this is going to be uh, bigger than or equal to the c over q for all Q in the natural numbers. So this does not include zero. As a set of badly proximal numbers, that this set exists uh, and is relatively big was shown by Yarnick in the 20s, I think. And as I said, this is a null set uh, with uh, full Hausdorff mention as winning. Another interpretation of this is if you know continued fractions, um, this is the set of continued fraction expansions which are uniformly bounded okay, by some. some um, so an element what would be its, its continued fraction digits would be uniformly bounded by some, some number. All right. So WA then is just equal to the complement. So this is a full measure set. OK? And so what did um, so what is our corollary? Corollary. Uh, is, it, is this just immediate? OK? So she uh, and me. So the set, you won't be surprised by this, of real numbers for which um, if I look at multiplication map on the circle, okay, and it is, uh, its orbit is, is non-dense, uh, non okay, so it misses some set of mark points, intersect the set of well approximable numbers. This has full Hausdorff dimension. So why do I say this is a, the counterpart to um, what Kaufman did? Because 
Hoffman's result is the following. Oh, by the way, how do you prove this from this? It's very simple. So here we have this part is the same, right? Our, our, our total, our multiplication math is non-dense. And this is just the, the Donnie correspondence that I told you about before. Okay, so it gives it to you for free immediately. Um, so what did, what did Kaufman do in the 80s? By the way, so, um, so Bob's work, there's other people generalizing his work just now um, related to some other things. So it's quite topical at the moment, I think. Uh, so here's, here's uh, Kaufman's theorem. Um, okay, it's as follows. So, um, so if I look at the set, the real numbers, this is what he showed using these, these measures on the set of ballet possible numbers. If I look at the four orbit of the multiplication map, this is going to be now dense. Okay. And if I intersect it with a set of badly possible numbers, then this has full house permission. It's the complement of, 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 of our corollary, right? Because we have well approximable and non-dense. He has dense here and non-dense here. Okay. We cannot actually derive his, uh, his result using our methods. And his methods does not apply to get that. So there happen to be complementary proofs at the moment. Okay, are there any questions before I tell you how some... N? Yeah, Oh, uh, here. To what? Um, that could be possible, uh, except then you know we would have to work harder on this this space, right? Because you can have like a beta shift or something, mm -hmm. but um, we haven't really given that much thought. It might be possible. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's see. So I told you about Kaufman's result. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do, so the, the, this proof here is related to the proof of theorem one, which I will tell you about right now. Um, and we have, have time, I'll, I'll tell you what was different. But, but the, the, the issue, you know, if we have time, I'll tell you what's different. But let me just try to prove theorem one for you, or at least give you an outline. Okay, so, okay, so, so here's proof of theorem one, which is, remember, the, the torus. Uh, so would you remind the statement there was that uh, uh, theorem one is if you have two commuting things? Yeah, so sure. Um, right, so if you have two commuting things, so TS commuting uh, hyperbolic toral monomorphisms. Uh, okay, so no rank one factor. And, and this is not a torus, it's a torus. torus, yeah. Uh, you can, uh, there's also a uh, counterpart for D equals one, uh, but I don't want to mention it. Um, then full house worth mentioned, so. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, pick a mark point. Uh, I'm gonna let. Uh, I'm gonna call this now X. Capital X. Okay. Pick a mark point. Then look at this set. Q is just gonna be some integer. Natural number. So these are going to be the, the set of points that are going to miss some neighborhood uh, around my mark point. Okay, so here I can take complete orbits because this thing is invertible. Okay, so if I look at this, what I want to do is I want to miss some open ball around x naught of radius one over q. This is going to be empty. Okay, this is a closed t invariant set. 
notice that if I make Q larger, if I make uh, Q larger, this, this part gets smaller, so I meet more. So these sets are growing. Okay. And in fact, when I take their union over Q, uh, what Broderick, Fishman, and Kleinbach uh, theorem says is that this is winning. So, union uh, Q from 1 to infinity of E of Q is winning. This is just the, the broderick fishman klumbach result. Okay? Winning, remember, implies full Hausdorff dimension. So this tells me immediately that the dimension of these EQs is going to the dimension of X. Because these EQs are, EQs are nested, and, and this is just an elementary property of dimension. Okay. Good. So now what do I need to do? I want to construct a measure on the set EQ. So, um, so there's going to exist some measure, and I'm going to use the variational principle. And remember, everything's compact, so there's, there's no question here. So support it on, support it on EQ. Okay. Such that, what do I want? I want the topological entropy of this map restricted to my T invariant subset. Remember, this is T invariant. Well, this is going to be the measure given, the, the measure theoretic entropy given by the measure I've constructed. Um, okay, so this is just the variational principle. Okay. Now, when Q is large, this dimension is near that. So large Q, dimension of EQ is, uh, I'm going to just use this total for near, okay? So dimension, uh, you'll see that I don't need to be precise, and I'll explain why in a moment. It's very close to that. So what do I have? So um, this, now, this implication is uh, maybe like a two-page uh, computation. This tells me that, after this computation, that the topological entropy of this restricted system, well, this is a really large fractal. So it's basically very close, again, very close to, and I'll, I'll tell you why I don't need to be precise in a moment, okay? To maximal topological entropy. All right, the upshot is that this is very close when Q is large. So the measure theoretical entropy of this restriction system is pretty close to the full entropy. And we need to, to know that. And I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. Okay, so now everything so far is for T, right? Um, I haven't introduced the map S. Remember, the map S is this map. It's the commuting hyperbolatorial automorphism. So now I need to involve it somehow. And, well, there are a number of ways you could do this, but what we do is we average. So, what do I want to do? I want to define these measures in u n. I'm just going to smear around the other map. So I need to uh, do the averaging correctly. It's 1 over n. Uh, and go from 0 to n minus 1 of the push forward of this of my measure nu, which I constructed. Okay, so as you recall what this means, so this notation means that I'm doing this. Okay, so push forward. Okay, so if I take the weak star limit, I'm gonna get some uh, probability measure. Okay, it's gonna be S invariant. Mm -hmm. So mu is some weak star limit. Okay, S invariant, but just by construction. Okay, I'm just averaging over S, so it's going to be invariant. Now, here's where I need the commutivity, because remember, these two maps commute, so this map will also be T invariant. Uh, I can't spell invariant. I probably still can't spell it anyway. All right, so I have this invariant. So why do I need this? Because I will eventually use 
the result by Einziedler and Lindenstrauss uh, on measure rigidity in the high rank, uh, high rank, in the, um, well, for, for rank two actions and high entropy. Okay, so, so here's a theorem. We'll just call this measure rigidity. And this is by Einziedler. All right. Okay, I's here. Uh, e, L, E, R, and Linda's rows. Okay, and this was came out in 03. This was a, a big paper. Well, let me uh, write it for the case that we need. So, so I want let T and S uh, for the torus be commuting hyperbolic toral automorphisms. So just our case, okay? And such that, well, they generate, um, these are just gonna be integers, little s and little t. This is the action that they generate. Remember, everything commutes, so this is well defined. Uh, such that this has no rank one factor. No rank one factor. Okay. Um, okay, so now what? So this is the setup that we have. We're using the same conditions. Now, if, if I have a measure nu, if nu is jointly t and s invariant, this is where the high rank comes in. Right? This is at least rank 2. Right? Invariant uh, ergodic probability measure, ergodic probability measure on the torus. Um, OK. Now, I think many people are familiar with the fact that uh, you need some entropy condition in order to make this argument work. Otherwise, famous theorems could be, uh, famous conjectures could be solved. So, um, OK. So the condition that we need is that the measure through entropy of t, and I just need it for one of the, the, the maps, t or s, it doesn't matter, is, and I don't want to be precise, but there is a precise statement here, the topological entropy of t. Uh, I'll, I'll explain why this is OK in a moment. Then, well, it's called measure rigidity for a reason. Then there's only one measure, and it's hard measure. OK, why, do I, why is this allowed? Because uh, what can happen to the entropy is that um, it is quantized on induced tori. So depending on the maps and the dimension, my entropy is sort of bounded in steps. So if it's actually very close to topological entropy, after some point for this system, I know it has to be full. OK? So that's the, the thing. And so when that happens, then I get hard measure. So that's the only possible measure. So either the measure gets stuck on lower dimensional tori, or if the entropy is big enough and sees all the space, it's only hard measure. If you're familiar with other measure rigidity results, there are I mean, other very famous ones, for example, the ones of, of Ratner for unipotent actions. But, but this is different. These are, uh, these are not unipotent actions. These are hyperbolic actions. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so. In particular, what does this mean? So now, um, so okay. So this, what is, what does this theorem of Einstein and Linnaeus tell us? Well, it tells us that um, okay. So this, I'm going to say measure, measure rigidity. Plus, well, I need ergodic decomposition. So if I have a, a, a system, I have a bunch of, of measures. Uh, I can uh, decompose it into some sum, uh, some integral of ergodic measures. So uh, I see. Ergodic decomposition. This implies that Haar measure uh, is, an, is a component of my measure mu. Not, not, not this one, but that one, the, the average measure. OK? So it, I'm just going to use ergodic decomposition to assume that um, this original measure knew that I got from the variational principle was actually ergodic. It makes things a little easier, at least for the talk. 
Um, so okay, so now we, we're assuming that original measure there is ergodic. So what this implies is that the measure of the dense set with respect to S is, well, okay, if you don't want it to be ergodic, it's positive. If you want it to be ergodic, it's one. Okay. How do you show this? Well, um, depending on how much time I have, I will try to tell you. Okay, I can try to tell you. So um, let's assume that this is not true. Okay, so assume that it's not true. So what that means is that um, the measure of this set is actually zero. Okay, so that means that the the new measure of the the non-dense uh, uh, orbits sets uh, sets with non-dense orbits is full measure. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take my measure new, and I'm going to just um, just going to decompose it into these measures. Okay, so these are going to be the, the points on my torus for which, well, we're, we're going to miss. This is the, the usual distance on the torus. It's S orbit. It's going to, closure is going to miss some Xi. So uh, I need Xi to be some countable collection of points inside my torus. Okay, so this is going to be bigger than or equal to 1 over n. All right. Now, I, I need to do some, I don't want to give you the, the full proof, but you need to do something to make this a partition. But you do that, okay? So this is telling me that I take my new measure on some full measure set. I have, what do I have? So up to some measure zero set, this is just the sum over i n of this. Okay? Now, the thing about this measure is that it doesn't see um, the ball of radius 1 over n around the point xi. So single with respect to hard measure. So I do what I did with, uh, with my measure new, but for this before. Go through, use measure rigidity, uh, and I show that I have to get hard measure as an ergodic component for each of these. But this is, uh, I've constructed a partition, not, not quite, but you can construct a partition this measure is then going to be, after I go through the same process, the new was, was supposed to have har measure as a ergodic component. But each of these are singular, OK? So they can't have har measure as an ergodic component. So that's a contradiction. OK, so that tells me that this actually, this measure sees uh, this set, the dense orbits. OK, so, so that. So now, okay, so now we have a measure that sees the set. Remember, this measure is supported on this set EQ, and EQs measure the non-dense points with respect to T. So good, we've involved S and T in the right way. And so now I need to put it together, and the thing to put it together is this well-known theorem of Le Trapier and Young, called the Le Trapier young formula. Um, okay, so uh, let me get a... Newer piece of chalk. So, um, uh, so Le Dropier uh, Young formula. Well, why do I need this? Well, I only have a measure so far. I need to get dimension. So I need to relate the dimension to some my measure. And the way to do this is this formula. Okay. Um, so what do I have? So. Um, okay, so um, let's let kappa i going from i going from uh, so we'll call it j, so j going from one to u, be the positive Lapinoff exponents. I cannot spell Lapinoff of t. Okay, so we have a toral hyperbolic toral orthomorphism. So the positive Lapinoff exponents are just going to be equal to the log of the absolute value of the eigenvalues that are bigger than 1. It's hyperbolic, so I have no eigenvalues that are 1. It's either less than 1 or bigger than 1. So those are easy for us. Okay. So given this, then what does the formula say then? Uh, there exists 
a bunch of numbers, gamma i, less than or equal to the dimension of ei. I want to mention that this is uh, done on leafwise measures. So I'm going to suppress that, uh, that um, bit to make it easier. These are going to be the, this is the tangent space at some, some point x in my space, uh, corresponding to the Lapinov uh, exponent. Uh, I do use j, uh, kappa sub j, OK? So this is going to be the dimension of the unstable foliation corresponding to that Lapinov exponent. All right. So what do we have? So we have, this is one conclusion. There exists this, this, this number. Uh, no, sorry. There exists this number such that the conclusions are as follows. One, I can, delta is going to be my pointwise dimension. I can sum it up, up to, um, up to this, uh, over all of the Lapinov exponents for the unstable. Um, and I have my kappa j, gamma j, okay? And two, what else do I have? I have that the measure theoretic entropy of my map t with respect to uh, my measure, some measure nu, the measure that I constructed, this is going to be, again, the same sum over the Lapinov exponents, the positive Lapinov exponents times these gamma j's. All right, so that's the conclusion. That's just uh, the Drapier Young formula. That's what we get, OK? OK, so what do we know? We, we've computed in the beginning that this is pretty close to, um, pretty close to this. OK, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I, I really want to be on this. OK, so um, we have this from our previous computation. So what does that tell me? That tells me that uh, these kappa, uh, this, this gamma i better be pretty close to, oh, and OK, so why do I need to know this? Well, th this is well known, right? So, so what is the, the topological entropy? It's just the sum over the positive Lapinov exponents of kappa j dimension of each of the spaces, OK? So what is this saying? This is saying that th these two numbers must be the same, must be getting close to each other. Uh, gamma j is pretty close to dimension of ej. OK. Well, if I sum over the dimensions of ej, I get the, the dimension of the unstable foliation. OK. So I got half of it. So when I, um, so it's not quite right because I need to use the, so I haven't told you the definition of this, the pointwise dimension yet, but y you can involve the measure and it will give you the following results. So let me just write down something without being very precise. Well, right now we have a, a measure and a pointwise dimension. And what we can do is just use the mass distribution principle. So, um, okay, so the upshot of what I just said is that this goes to the dimension of the unstable manifold for, um, for my torus, OK? Um, yeah, let's call it that. And so if I use the mass distribution principle, uh, this tells me that uh, the dimension of my set supported on my fractal, the new, OK, in, in the mass distribution principle. Uh, intersect the unstable, that this is going to be bounded by the pointwise dimension. Okay, so it's not hard, but I don't want to tell you how to, to uh, derive that from the mass distribution principle. Okay, but, but you get this, and you get, so we're getting half the, the Hausdorff dimension because we need the other half. So what do we do? Well, it's easy. So I just now uh, reverse, instead of looking at t, uh, and uh, instead of looking at t, I look at t inverse. It's invertible. The unstable and stable foliations switch their roles. I go through this whole entire process again, and I'm going to get the, the other thing. So I'm going to get the dimension of D of S intersect this on the stable foliation. It's going to be bigger than the dimension of stable foliation. Okay? And so now I just need to put it together. And the way to put it together is the Marsh-Strand slicing theorem, which I don't want to 
to write down, but it allows me to um, add these two. And the dimension of my torus is just the dimension of stable and unstable. I get a product, I get a local product decomposition using, and using the Marchand slicing theorem, I can add these two. So therefore, I get a full HD. Okay, and so that is a rough outline of the proof. Okay, so let me see if I, do I have no time? No, okay, I should oh, stop here. No okay, thank you.